Yes. Uh, Sir Bernard, uh, could we ask just how accurate is your telescope? Can you, um, uh, you lock on presumably to the signal, so therefore because of a time lag, do you then lock on to a space slightly behind the spacecraft? Yeah, well, one and a quarter seconds different, which is the time which the radio waves take to come from the moon to the telescope. Yes. Um, of course, the, as far as the accuracy is concerned, none of the telescopes in this tracking network have um, a narrow enough beam to uh, get the precise position of the sp spacecraft. Nearly the whole of this data is got from measuring the shift, the Doppler change and the frequency of the signals. And from that, one can deduce the velocity and the acceleration of the spacecraft. Yes. Uh, rather like, rather, the Doppler effect is, is when one hears a train whistle, for example, exactly. approaching, getting higher and then lower. Yes, yes. And if you know how low it is, you know how far away it's gone or the, how far away it has to come. This is a standard technique used mm. in all these radio observations of, of deep space probes. And your one and three quarter second lag is a, at their speed of, say, 3,700 miles an hour, is quite a few miles. Well, um, yes. It's one and a quarter seconds, actually. One and a quarter seconds. Yes. Mm. Um, of course, you know, I think one of the rather amazing thing about this entire operation is that so much that is going on at this very moment is entirely new. All these experiments are new, they haven't been done before, and so far there have been no hitches at all. And this, I think, is a most tremendous triumph for American technology. Yes, I was amazed to hear from Houston this morning that after months of preparation, they are in fact something like seven seconds behind schedule after several months of preparation. Well, one thing I think is certain here, that if they hadn't been pretty, pretty sure of their ground, they wouldn't have done it. Because I don't myself believe in all this talk we've heard over the years that there's a kind of space race on and both America and Russia are doing things before they're ready to and risking the lives of astronauts. This, quite frankly, I don't believe. I don't believe that either America or Russia will take on this kind of experiment until they are so confident of, of success that it really is justified. And would you care to comment on that, Sir Bernard? I am, like uh, Mr. Boyer, I'm trem tremendously impressed by this engineering feat. I think it's altogether remarkable. It does inspire uh, complete confidence, uh, confidence in the success of this mission. I also feel it's the first time ever that there is a real chance that a man will be on the moon in 1969. There's quite a lot to be done, the test of the LEM and the landing of the LEM on the moon. But nevertheless, this demonstration of technique and the organization of it impresses me. I think this is extraordinarily important. The management of this vast project, uh, I find it almost quite overwhelming. Uh, you said on an earlier uh, program, during, just after the launch, that uh, you were in a better position to deal with the Russians because you were in a better position on the Earth with your yes. telescopes vis-a-vis -vis their tracks. Uh, what's the latest information that you have about any activity going on in Russia? Well, <laughs> we have none at all. I, <laughs> I, um, uh, there was a lot of, lot, lot of rumours that they might try a Zon 7 with a man in it and beat the Americans, but uh, we were not a party to that rumour. I imagine that early in 1969 the Russians will start up again but I'm not at all sure that they're ready to do a man like uh, Patrick Moore I I think that they they're extremely careful about taking on due risks with with uh, with the lives of their astronauts and the whole experience of the Russian space program indicates that having recovered one Zon successfully after lunar orbit they'll probably do another one either with a dog in it or perhaps one or two more before they trust a man uh, have they have they in fact got a rocket as big as Saturn that could take up the, a number of men and above all a, a heavy enough capsule with thick enough insulation so that they wouldn't there, have to worry about radiation? There is no evidence that they have anything as big as Saturn V at the moment and they take three men around the moon they could do it with one but uh, uh, this is rather maybe taking a rather short uh, too short a look at the situation uh, there are a lot of rumors and I believe uh, that there is good evidence that the Russians have a really enormous booster in preparation. But of course, I, I think that their approach to the lunar problem is quite different from the Americans. And um, the evidence is, I, and I've always believed this, that the Russians will not do the Apollo technique mm. of getting men on the moon. They're more likely to build up in Earth orbit. And they've already done quite a few experiments of linking up spacecraft. They did with their two Zoyas 2 and 3 a few months ago. Mm. Mm. So I think the question <laughs> of the size of their booster, which they have, is not really relevant to how they are going to get, or how many men they're going to get on the moon, because I think their technique is different. Do you, think, uh, do you think we're likely to see anything from them as we are in about, one hopes, two or three minutes, uh, these uh, live transmissions from space that will that be coming up, we hope, any minute now? Well, the Russians have been transmitting live from space. Their lunar orbiters, of course, they transmitted television uh, pictures of the lunar surface. And um, from no, I meant, our experience I meant, I meant, in studying the transmissions from their Zons 5 and 6, 
uh, it's quite clear that they have a very comprehensive wideband system and I, I would think the answer to your question is yes. Uh, we will see the same sort of television transmissions by the Russians once they get to the moon as we're now seeing from Apollo. Yes, I ask that because it does seem there are criticisms from time to time about the American project in that this television transmission to Earth is nothing really more than a sort of uh, uh, public relations venture in order to keep NASA in the news and keep it, uh, keep it getting its funds. Well, I think that's uh, taking a rather poor view of the situation. Yes. What, I, what? I, I think, uh, I said before in this flight, that the great thing about the Apollo flight is the great adventure of the human spirit here, and I think that uh, man on Earth should be shown what's happening is all part of this great project. Yes. I'm afraid I don't take the view that it's uh, nonsense to transmit <laughs> pictures back. Uh, I if it were, we wouldn't be in a job. <laughs> yeah. Extraordinary thing, uh, Mr. Burke. You know, I, I've been hearing the astronauts uh, 230,000 miles away with perfect clarity. It's amazing how difficult, uh, what difficulty I'm having in hearing you, only <laughs> 180 miles away. Yes, we've had the same problem. I wonder if we could just go over and listen for a moment to some of that transmission going on now from, from, from uh, Houston. Of course, they're still on the other side. They're still on the other side. They'll be coming back very shortly, though. And this time, they certainly will be on schedule. And there's no doubt about there's it. There's no burn on the other side. There's no rocket no, firing They on aren't the doing side. anything, you see, with the rocket at the present moment. They're merely making the moon's gravity to do it for them. So I think there's no doubt at all that we will hear them on schedule. And that should be literally any minute. Any minute. Coming up, I think. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, over. <laughs> That's Jerry Carr making a call. <laughs> And uh, BBC One have just joined us. I'd like to welcome their, their viewers. And uh, with me in the studio, Patrick Moore and at uh, Jodrell Bank, Sir Bernard Lovell. Um, before we go any further, we'd like you to hear with us the tape that uh, was recorded this morning at 11.23 after Apollo 8 had successfully gone round the far side of the moon and reappeared. And after 47 minutes of nail-biting silence, <laughs> This is what we heard. Yes, I know, but is this Apollo a Apollo Control, Houston. Uh, is this a we've playback? acquired signal, but uh, no voice contact yet. We're standing by. Mm -hmm. Apollo Control, Houston. Uh, we're looking at engine data, and it looks good. Uh, tank pressures look good. Uh, we have not talked yet with the crew, but uh, we're standing by. But we've got it, uh, we've got it, Apollo uh, 8 um, now in, Apollo 8 that you can see in now. lunar orbit. Uh, there's a chair in the, this room. Uh, this is and this is the satellite picture that is now coming from Apollo 8 in its second orbit round the moon. And there is the moon. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit clear. Roger, the moon is uh, very bright and uh, not too distinct. I'll give you a shot of the horizon. Roger. Remember, when you hear them referring to TVE, it's, it's Madrid that's receiving these pictures. Uh, Paul, this is Houston. Uh, it's a good picture of the horizon. Uh, we can't see many terrain features as yet. Houston, we're beginning to pick up a few uh, craters uh, very dimly. The whole thing is pretty bright. Roger, there's not much definition up here either on the horizon. We're now approaching the uh, craters C and Bassett. Uh, Roger. I'll shift to the rendezvous window. Roger, Bill. Apollo 8, Houston, we want to take the DSC. And this is through the rendezvous window, so they're pointing straight Roger. at the moon. Looks like we've got a real good picture now. Okay, that's the crater brilliant. Roger. Sorry we missed car. Me too. Those you're hearing uh, from the spacecraft, Bill Anders. Bill Anders, the lunar module pilot, the can youngest wait, member. Uh, Roger, we can wait. Okay, I think we're coming up on uh, Miller right now. 